a shocking secret tears a family apart. A husband's near-death experience unveils a sinister plot of greed and betrayal by his own sister. As the truth about her cruel treatment of her son comes to light, a bitter custody battle ensues. This powerful story will leave you questioning how well you truly know those closest to you. But about everything in order. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, give us a like and leave a comment. So, here we go. The weight of this uncertainty crushed me, and I felt my legs give way beneath me. Collapsing to my knees, I sobbed in despair, overwhelmed by the thought of an uncertain future without my soulmate by my side. The next day, amidst the gloom of the hospital room, a familiar face appeared. It was my nephew, Tyler, whom I hadn't seen in years. His unexpected visit brought a glimmer of light to the darkness that had engulfed me. Little did I know that beneath the surface of our seemingly perfect life, a secret had been lurking, threatening to unravel everything we had built together. Mike's confession had now set off a chain of unexpected events, and I found myself standing at a crossroads, unsure of which path to take. As the years passed, our bond only grew stronger. We were still that close couple, relying on each other for love, support, and companionship. Before turning 30, the desire to have children began to stir within me, and when I shared this longing with Mike, he revealed that he, too, yearned to start a family. So, with hope and excitement, we embarked on the journey of trying to conceive, eagerly awaiting the day when our dreams of parenthood would come true. Tyler approached me with a solemn expression, his voice filled with compassion. Auntie, he began, Uncle Mike left something with me a while back. He wanted me to give it to you. Confused and curious, I reached out to accept the letter he held out to me. As I unfolded the fragile paper and began reading its contents, my world turned upside down once again. The letter contained an unbelievable confession from Mike, revealing a secret that he had kept hidden from me. My heart raced as I absorbed the shocking revelations he had penned. Unable to process it all, I knew I had to verify the truth of his words. With a heavy heart, I mustered the courage to undress the unconscious Mike, searching for confirmation of the letter's claims. I received a phone call that shattered my world. It was the hospital informing me that my beloved husband, Mike, had been involved in a terrible accident. My heart raced as I rushed to his side, praying for his safety. When I arrived, the doctor reassured me that the surgery had been successful, but Mike had yet to regain consciousness. My mind raced with a mixture of hope and fear as the doctor explained that it was uncertain when he would wake up. It could be in a matter of days, or it could stretch into months, or even years. Despite the pain and confusion that consumed me, I couldn't help but reflect on the beautiful moments we had shared as a couple. Mike and I had gotten married early on, surprising our friends with our deep connection and compatibility. We were a team, supporting each other through thick and thin. I had always been passionate about my work, and when I expressed my desire to continue working after marriage, Mike fully supported me. We were partners, equal in every sense of the word. To my dismay, the evidence I discovered confirmed the authenticity of his confession. In that moment, my world shattered into a million pieces. Mike's secret, which had remained hidden from me for so long, was now exposed, leaving me grappling with a whirlwind of emotions. Throughout his life, my father-in-law had provided us with immense support, especially during our early years of marriage when we were struggling financially. We were heavily reliant on the food supplies provided by my in-laws, until we finally started earning enough to support ourselves and even consider starting a family. It was during this time that we began thinking about how to repay the kindness and assistance we had received from my father-in-law. Unfortunately, just as we were making plans to do so, he made the decision to move into a facility. Two years prior to his passing, my mother-in-law had also passed away, leaving my father-in-law alone. In an effort to repay our debt to him, my husband and I had offered to have him live with us, but he refused to inconvenience us, a young couple, and instead chose to use his savings to reside in a facility that could cater to his needs. Upon moving to the facility, he made the difficult decision to sell the family home and land, presumably to fund his stay there. I distinctly remember him mentioning his desire to leave a living inheritance for Mike, which further emphasized the importance of repaying our debt to him. Overall, the loss of my father-in-law has left a deep void in our lives. 
His sudden departure and the impact it has had on our emotional well-being has made it difficult for us to carry on with our daily activities, including eating properly. We will forever be grateful for the support he provided throughout his lifetime, and it is now our responsibility to uphold his memory and ensure that his wishes for our family are fulfilled. However, the nightmare surrounding his mother-in-law's death was about to resurface. Mike had an older sister who always seemed to create problems, and he had barely even gotten to know her before their mother's passing. Instead of mourning their mother's loss, she only seemed to care about her share of the inheritance. Even before the funeral had taken place, she demanded her portion in a commanding manner, completely disregarding the grief their father was experiencing. Mike, realizing that he had more than enough money to sustain himself for the rest of his life, made the decision to encourage his father to spend it freely without worrying. Little did Mike know that his father would unexpectedly pass away shortly after his mother-in-law's death. In hindsight, Mike couldn't help but regret not insisting that his father live with them and feeling unable to repay the kindness his father had shown him. Despite his sorrow, Mike knew that life must go on. To put an end to his demanding daughter's relentless requests, their father reluctantly gave her what he referred to as severance money, with the strict condition that she never make contact with him again. It was as if he was disowning her, and she understood that. Since then, she has not made an appearance in their father's life, despite her desire to see him. Unfortunately, he has not shared his whereabouts with her, leaving her unable to fulfill her wish. With no other choice, Mike took it upon himself to contact his sister. He dialed her mobile number, uncertain if she would even answer. After a lengthy ring, she finally picked up the call. Mike wasted no time with exchanging pleasantries and immediately delved into the matter at hand, informing her about my father-in-law's demise, the funeral arrangements, and the inheritance. As time went on, Mike's annoyance grew more and more apparent. His sister's voice was unmistakably loud, and I could even hear her side of the conversation through the phone. Mike and I were completely unaware of the sale of his parents' house, which led us to believe that his sister had also not visited the property. This lack of knowledge on her part could potentially result in her demanding a portion of the sale proceeds, given her nature. If she were to discover the truth, it would be possible to conceal my father-in-law's death but dealing with her complaints at a later stage would undoubtedly be an unpleasant ordeal. In order to prevent any future complications, we made the decision to reach out to her and distribute the assets equally. However, the issue lies in the will. My father-in-law was extremely concerned about her behavior and made it a priority to draft a clear and concise will to prevent any impulsive actions on her part. I became aware of his intentions during our last meeting approximately two weeks ago, but unfortunately, he passed away before being able to execute his plan. Tragic as it may be, such unexpected events can occur. In the midst of dealing with the aftermath of the funeral and various other arrangements, she persistently called us almost every day, solely fixated on the inheritance. At first, Mike patiently explained the situation to her, but as time went on, he grew increasingly tired of her incessant calls and began to ignore them. Finally, Mike made the decision to meet with her face to face. Surprisingly, she seemed remarkably cheerful about the progress of things. This news made me feel uneasy, and I wanted to accompany Mike to the meeting, but he insisted on handling it alone. Mike's primary concern was for his nephew, who was the son of the woman in question. However, she didn't utter a word about how her son was coping or where he was. Any attempt to bring up the topic was overshadowed by her relentless focus on the inheritance matter. Mike believed that it was probably for the best that she didn't attend the funeral, in order to avoid a repetition of the chaos that occurred at my mother-in-law's funeral. I agreed to support his decision to remain silent if that was what he felt most comfortable with. Despite being unable to attend the funeral, she still had the audacity to demand her portion of the inheritance. It was clear that there was no grieving for my father-in-law on her part. Despite Mike's efforts to stay composed during their conversation, it felt as though she completely dominated the discussion. After hanging up, Mike's distress was evident, and he revealed that she had apparently divorced and now wanted to discuss the distribution of the inheritance after the funeral. Then, out of nowhere, my phone rang. The number was unfamiliar, but the name of a hospital appeared on the screen. 
In this modern age, phones often display the sender's name even if the number is not saved in our contacts, especially if it is from an important institution. Mike and I have always prided ourselves on our good health, with very few hospital visits in our history. The hospital that was calling me was one that my late mother-in-law had visited frequently before her passing. I was puzzled as to why they would be contacting me. For the past two years, I have been assisting Mike with all the necessary tasks and arrangements following the passing of his parents. He believed it would be best for me not to be involved in dealing with his sister and the distribution of the inheritance, assuring me that he could handle it on his own. Trusting his judgment, I decided to step back and observe how things would unfold. Initially, I had planned to accompany him regardless, but a sudden increase in workload at my company made it impossible for me to align my schedule with his. Consequently, Mike ended up meeting his sister alone as planned. That day at work was particularly hectic, with everyone focused on their tasks in silence. During my break, my mind couldn't help but wander to thoughts of Mike and his meeting. I tried to refocus on work, telling myself that no news was good news. Upon receiving the call from the nurse and confirming Mike's identity, I was informed about his urgent hospitalization. I quickly left work, explained the situation to my boss, and rushed to the hospital where Mike was still undergoing treatment. The nurse informed me of his critical condition and the need for emergency surgery, leaving me feeling overwhelmed and shaken. However, her stern yet compassionate words snapped me out of my daze, reminding me of the gravity of the situation. As I signed the necessary documents, the doctors assured me that there was hope for Mike's recovery, giving me a glimmer of relief. I spent the day making arrangements for his hospital stay and contacting loved ones before finally being able to sit by his side late at night feeling grateful that he was still alive. Tears came naturally, and I allowed them to fall freely as I tightly held his hand in the room where it was just the two of us. I continued to talk to him, hoping for a response, but he remained unresponsive throughout the night. Despite the nurse's suggestion that I take a break, I refused to leave his side, proud of my physical endurance as the hours passed by. It was around noon when Mike's sister unexpectedly walked into the room, the first time I had seen her since my mother-in-law's funeral. We exchanged a brief nod, but internally, I couldn't help but wonder why she had appeared. I had informed only a select few relatives and work colleagues about Mike's condition, and she was not among them, given the strained relationships within the family. It was clear that she had been ostracized by our father-in-law and the rest of the family, so her sudden presence left me puzzled. As I pondered her presence, I couldn't help but question how she knew about the hospital and why she had come. It seemed unlikely that she had seen me anywhere else in the hospital, as I had not left Mike's side. With so many questions swirling in my mind, I finally mustered the courage to ask her about her knowledge of the situation and what she thought about Mike's condition. Her assumption about his unconscious state leading to brain death seemed lacking in sensitivity. Instead of showing concern for his safety or chances of recovery, she seemed to have already given up hope for his recovery. It's interesting that he still hasn't regained consciousness. I suppose that means his time is running out. Considering the effort I made to come here, it would be fair for her to cover my travel and meal expenses. Her attitude was extremely frustrating. What aggravated me even more was that I hadn't even invited her, yet she had the audacity to demand compensation for her uninvited visit. I struggled to hide my irritation, reminding myself of the hospital environment we were in, with other patients around and the nurses stationed nearby. The last thing I wanted was to create a scene in front of Mike. So, I took out more money from my wallet than necessary and reluctantly gave it to her. Anticipating the possibility of her feeling dissatisfied if I were to offer her a lesser amount, I made the decision to refrain from engaging in any further conversation with her at that particular moment. It appeared that she was content with the amount provided as she left the room with a buoyant stride, mentioning her intention to indulge in a meal. However, just as she was about to exit, she abruptly halted and beckoned the child to join her in the room. It was none other than her own flesh and blood, my dear son and her beloved nephew. With a sense of responsibility, she entrusted me with the task of looking after him while she indulged in her sustenance. In a commanding manner, she spoke to me and swiftly made her way out of the hospital room, her heels echoing with each click against the floor. She moved so quickly that I didn't even have a chance to utter a word to her. 
Left behind, the young boy seemed unsure at first, but then approached me with a determined expression. Hi, he greeted, my uncle asked me to give you something. He motioned for us to have a private conversation, so I stooped down to his level. From his pocket, he retrieved an item and handed it to me, explaining that his uncle wanted me to have it without his mom knowing. He mentioned that if he followed through, he might be able to live with his dad. I reassured him with a few pats on the head, letting him know that he had done the right thing. The object he handed me turned out to be a letter from Mike. It wasn't a formal letter, but rather a torn piece of paper from a notebook. Without wasting any time, I eagerly read through its contents. Mike had planned to meet his sister at a cafe, but she unexpectedly called him to her house instead. Suspecting that something was amiss, Mike decided to document the events while keeping a watchful eye out for any opportunities. However, the situation took an intriguing turn when his sister insinuated that she was responsible for the injury. She claimed to have intentionally inflicted the wound in the midst of the crowd, with the intention of targeting an artery, but ultimately failing. What struck me the most was her precise knowledge of the wound's exact location. In order to verify Mike's account, I discreetly examined his thigh while he was unconscious, and to my dismay, I discovered the presence of the old cut. It wasn't that I doubted his story, but a part of me secretly hoped that such a wound would not actually exist. He brought up a surprising revelation about an injury he had sustained while his mother was alive, which I had never heard about before. It seemed that he had taken care of it on his own without my knowledge. This mention in his letter left me curious about his motives for bringing it up. As I continued to read, an astonishing narrative unraveled during the disputes over his mother's inheritance. Mike recalled a peculiar sensation in his leg while walking through a crowd, only to discover a deep and unexpected cut on his thigh. Naturally, he was taken aback by this discovery and upon further investigation, he found a utility knife concealed in his pocket that he used for work. Although the blade was not exposed, he speculated that it might have accidentally cut him in just the wrong spot. Fortunately, the wound appeared to be minor and likely to heal without complications. In light of the busy period they were going through, he made the decision not to inform me and instead managed the injury on his own. In the letter, Mike expressed his belief that his life was in danger. The rushed handwriting suggested that he had written it while his sister was briefly out of the room. I found it strange that she had insisted on having her son, Mike's nephew, present during their discussions about the inheritance. Before she was cut off from the family, Mike had adored his nephew, and it seemed like his sister was planning to manipulate their relationship to secure a larger share of the inheritance. Fearing for his safety, Mike had instructed his nephew to give me the letter if anything happened to him. He also mentioned that there was evidence in the inner pocket of his jacket. When I searched the jacket he had been wearing during the incident, the bloodstains indicated the severity of his injuries. I had refrained from touching it until the nurse handed it to me along with his other personal belongings. The idea of someone hurting another person in order to receive an inheritance was absolutely repulsive to me. While inheriting money or assets is always a better outcome than causing harm to increase one's own share, it is still morally wrong. Despite my hopes for a peaceful resolution, I discovered an old wound on Mike's thigh that clearly showed his sister's malicious intentions. This revelation filled me with anger, but I focused on caring for Mike and returning to the letter he had left behind. Following the doctor's instructions, I reached into the inner pocket and discovered a solid object, which turned out to be a voice recorder. I remembered the doctor's remarks about Mike's injuries on his arms indicating he had shielded his chest during the fall. The doctor's inquiry about Mike's heart condition was unexpected, as Mike had always prided himself on his good health. The voice recorder from the chest pocket revealed the truth, Mike had protected it at the risk of his life. As I played the recording, I was left speechless by its shocking contents, which could incriminate his sister. Without hesitation, I contacted the authorities immediately. Upon his sister's return, she seemed carefree and content, even taking the chair I had been sitting on. As she sat down and began touching up her makeup, I inquired about the inheritance distribution and she claimed that Mike had agreed to give her a larger share. When I asked about her whereabouts during Mike's fall, she seemed evasive. When he stumbled and fell, she claimed that they had gone their separate ways immediately after leaving the cafe where they first met. 
She insisted that she was completely unaware of the accident, but that was a lie. The conversation had taken a sudden turn to her sister-in-law's house, and all subsequent events were documented on a voice recorder that Mike had concealed. Instead of immediately calling her out on her deception, I chose to ask her about her memories with Mike and their father, why she hadn't disclosed her divorce sooner, and how she was coping with life. I also probed about the details of her departure from the restaurant, how long she had lingered there, and the name of the establishment. However, she quickly grew frustrated and pushed me away, declaring that Mike was her father and that I was merely an outsider who had married into the family. Though I may not have a direct stake in the inheritance, Mike's life-threatening accident had a profound impact on me. I begged her to come clean about the truth. Do you think I'm lying? She snapped, visibly incensed. In response, I played the recording from the voice recorder, which captured Mike's concerns about the difficult conversation and his decision to record it as evidence. Recognizing the need to defuse the situation, Mike deftly changed the subject and proposed relocating to a public place. He suggested a nearby fish restaurant and offered to treat his sister. In a surprising turn of events, her demeanor immediately shifted, and she agreed to get ready for their outing. Seizing the moment, Mike hastily wrote a letter to me, whispering his instructions to his nephew and entrusting the letter to him. He mentioned the presence of a voice recorder, hoping that I would discover it, but just to be safe, he made sure his nephew had the letter in his possession. With a sinister gleam in her eyes, she confessed, I thought if you were out of the picture, I'd be able to secure more for myself. Although she confessed to feeling scared at the time and limited her actions to just a cut, she now boasted about her ability to orchestrate accidents. She ominously warned Mike to be cautious of his surroundings, especially his back and high places, as she claimed to always be watching for an opportunity. The intensity of fear and tension in Mike's voice was palpable as it echoed through the recording, leaving a lingering sense of danger if he were to stay at her house. His sister wasted no time in pressuring him for a larger portion of their father's inheritance. At first, she approached the matter with some restraint, claiming that she needed assistance in raising her nephew alone. However, when Mike rejected her suggestion and insisted that she seek child support from her ex-husband, her attitude took a drastic turn. She shockingly admitted to purposely cutting Mike's thigh during their argument over their mother's inheritance. In summary, the events following their lunch at the restaurant took an unexpected turn, with Mike's sister vehemently opposing his decision to involve a lawyer. The situation escalated further with the sudden disturbance and the subsequent discovery of a recording that raised questions about the true nature of Mike's fall. Amidst the uncertainty, the sister-in-law's defensive reaction and the potential implications it held for the police investigation added an additional layer of intrigue to the unfolding events. Once the playback ended, Mike's sister-in-law initially displayed shock, but soon her demeanor transformed into defiance. She questioned the significance of the recording, dismissing it as a mere sibling argument that had no relevance to their inheritance dispute. She argued that it was merely an incident, not an accident, and that it provided no concrete evidence to support any claims. Irritated, she even insinuated that her own innocence was being questioned. However, Mike's brother calmly pointed out that the recording could serve as enough evidence to raise suspicions of foul play and warrant police investigation. Despite his sister's objections, Mike remained firm in his decision and firmly stated that involving a third party, namely a lawyer, was the most appropriate course of action. He was convinced that it would bring clarity to their dispute. Suddenly, the peaceful atmosphere was shattered by the sound of something falling or rolling, followed by a chaotic commotion and the desperate cries for an ambulance. The recording abruptly stopped, possibly due to the stop button being inadvertently pressed when Mike's jacket was removed for emergency treatment. After leaving her house to go to a restaurant, Mike kindly treated his sister to lunch, but she remained her usual self and showed no signs of gratitude. As they left the restaurant, Mike suggested to his brother Ed that they consult a lawyer to help resolve the deadlock in their ongoing discussion. However, when Mike mentioned he was heading home, his sister insisted on accompanying him to the station, seemingly unwilling to let him go alone. Throughout their walk, she persistently tried to dissuade him from involving a lawyer, claiming that it would only complicate matters further. The entrance to the hospital room was discreetly blocked by plainclothes detectives, leaving no easy escape route for the sister-in-law. With no way out, she frantically searched for a way to evade the police. 
However, jumping out of a window was not a viable option on the fourth floor. A detective approached the sister-in-law, who was visibly shaken and pale, and began questioning her about her involvement with Mike. It was suspected that she may have been the last person with him before the incident occurred, raising suspicions that it was more than just an accident. Despite her attempts to deny any involvement, the police were determined to uncover the truth. While the sister-in-law was away, the police had already arrived and confirmed the contents of the voice recorder they had been waiting for in hiding, anticipating her return. Upon discovering the incriminating evidence, she gasped in disbelief. Her arrogant and confident demeanor quickly shifted to one of fear as the reality of her actions began to sink in. The former brother-in-law acknowledged me with a nod, expressing his gratitude, before embracing his son tightly, as if vowing never to let go. Throughout the interaction between the sister-in-law and the police, the nephew had been frightened and hiding behind me, feeling disheartened even after the police had left. However, his spirits were immediately lifted upon the arrival of his father, bringing him a sense of comfort and security. It is common for culprits to alter their stories and make incoherent statements, which was precisely what the sister-in-law was doing. As the police took her away, I handed over the voice recorder to the detective who seemed to be leading the investigation. Once the sister-in-law's dramatic episode had subsided, another person entered the scene. I had made another call for assistance, and as the nephew caught sight of the man entering, he exclaimed, Daddy, before joyfully leaping into his father's waiting arms. Throughout the marriage, the responsibility of raising their child fell predominantly on the shoulders of my former brother-in-law, with occasional assistance from his parents. Therefore, when the couple decided to part ways, my brother-in-law naively believed that obtaining custody would be a straightforward matter. Little did he know that his ex-wife had a different agenda in mind. Cunningly presenting herself as a devoted mother in need of child support, she managed to sway the court's decision in her favor, ultimately winning custody. It seems that in custody battles, mothers often hold an advantage, and my brother-in-law reluctantly had to accept this reality. Perhaps, over time, my sister-in-law had developed some semblance of maternal instincts, as she never physically abused their son. Society often claims that women possess an innate motherly instinct, but in the case of my sister-in-law, this theory proved to be an exception. In truth, her decision to retain custody was solely driven by financial gain, using the child support funds for her own indulgences. Disturbingly, her mistreatment of their son became a regular occurrence, including depriving him of basic necessities like food and subjecting him to confinement in a closet. The first time I encountered my former brother-in-law was at my mother-in-law's funeral, marking the end of a long period of estrangement. I had reached out to him with a purpose in mind. It turns out that during that encounter, I managed to obtain a voice recording that revealed the true sentiments of my sister-in-law towards her own son. Shockingly, she confessed to never having desired a child and only giving birth out of obligation, devoid of any genuine affection for him. In summary, the meeting with my former brother-in-law not only served as a reunion but also exposed the dark truth behind my sister-in-law's actions and the unfortunate dynamics of their custody battle. In the heartfelt letter penned by Mike, it became evident that his utmost priority was to liberate his nephew from the clutches of this distressing situation, even if it meant relinquishing his entire inheritance. His insistence on involving a lawyer extended beyond the scope of preserving his rightful share, as he was genuinely concerned about his nephew's well-being. This unyielding determination of my husband struck a chord within me, as it showcased his unwavering resolve even in the face of the imminent danger posed by his own sister. It was clear that his ultimate goal was to rescue our nephew from this perilous predicament. This revelation prompted me to reflect upon my own stance in this ordeal. While the inheritance offered a sense of security, I realized that it paled in comparison to the importance of standing by Mike's side and upholding his resolute determination. After all, we are young and capable of forging our own path, and I understood that Mike's decision to relinquish his inheritance for the sake of our nephew was justified. In his belief, by offering the entirety of his inheritance, he hoped to appeal to his sister-in-law's greed, which would ultimately lead her to release custody of her nephew. However, it became evident through the letter that the matter did not merely conclude with the transfer of inheritance and retrieval of our nephew. The harm inflicted upon Mike by his sister-in-law demanded that she be held accountable for her actions. 
it was imperative that she not only faced the consequences of her behavior but also experienced sincere remorse for her transgressions. As I recounted the contents of Mike's letter and described the significant changes I witnessed in his son, the former brother-in-law's anger grew more intense. He couldn't help but blame himself for the unfortunate events that occurred after his divorce. Despite the nephew living with his mother, the former brother-in-law had managed to secure a monthly visitation agreement. However, his sister-in-law consistently demanded child support while denying him any opportunity to see his son. She made one excuse after another, threatening to permanently keep the nephew away from him if he persisted in trying to visit. This left him feeling completely powerless and filled with regret for not standing up to his sister-in-law sooner. Despite feeling helpless, he secretly checked on his ex-wife and continuously apologized to his nephew for the situation. Finally, he made the resolution to confront his sister. To his surprise, it was revealed that his sister had already been reported for not just the suspicious circumstances surrounding Mike's fall but also for her mistreatment of the children. The authorities from the youth division arrived, expressing their desire to hear the nephew's side of the story, and as a guardian, I was required to be present. Accompanied by my ex-brother-in-law, we joined the authorities for the meeting. As we waited for news on Mike's recovery, it was uncertain when or if he would regain consciousness, it could be in a mere hour or potentially even a year. As the investigation progressed, surveillance footage from a nearby shop revealed her making a pushing motion near the staircase where Mike was pushed, although the angle of the camera did not definitively prove her guilt. However, the detective remained confident that they would obtain a clear confession from the sister-in-law now that she was in custody. Due to the urgent nature of the nephew's situation, it was decided to prioritize him. At the police station, a heated confrontation erupted between my ex-brother-in-law, who was there with his nephew, and Mike's sister, who was still considered a person of interest at that point, in a moment of distress or possibly irrationality. She began making wild accusations, claiming that he was the one who told her to do it and that he was a demon. Claiming to be the true victim, she accused her own son of being the child of a demon, prompting her ex-husband to speak out in defense of their child. Despite his attempts to reason with her, she continued to make threats and shift the blame onto others, ultimately leading to her being taken away by the police for the safety of those around her. Despite the occurrence of these events, there was still no concrete evidence to support our suspicions. It was during the police questioning of Mike's sister that he mentioned having something important to disclose to the detective. In accordance with Mike's request, we managed to arrange a meeting with the detective. During this meeting, Mike revealed that his sister had pushed him from behind and suggested that her handprints must be evident on the jacket he was wearing at the time. To our relief, the forensic analysis confirmed the presence of her handprints on the jacket, alongside distinct fingerprints. Nevertheless, we remained apprehensive that she might attempt to deny her involvement. As a result, the police went to great lengths to thoroughly review all the security camera footage in the vicinity. In addition to this, they reached out to the public, appealing for any potential information that could aid in the investigation. Fortunately, someone who had been filming nearby came forward, stating that their footage might have captured the altercation. Upon reviewing the footage, it became unmistakably clear that the sister-in-law was indeed responsible for pushing Mike. The focus of attention shifted towards determining the custody of the nephew after examining her recorded statements. Upon considering the nephew's account, it was decided that he should reside with my ex-brother-in-law. The nephew was overwhelmingly delighted by this decision, as he would now be living with his father, who along with his parents, was committed to providing him a comfortable life. Following the police interrogation, I made the firm decision to remain by Mike's side at the hospital until he regained consciousness. However, much to my surprise, Mike regained consciousness the very next morning. Mike was faced with undeniable evidence, leaving his sister-in-law defeated and arrested without putting up a fight. After some time to recover, Mike, along with his lawyer, decided to demand compensation and medical expenses from his sister-in-law. However, their efforts were in vain as her bank account was completely empty and she didn't possess anything of significant value. Even her beloved designer bags turned out to be counterfeit, obtained from dubious sources. When confronted about compensation, she simply stated that she had nothing to offer. In a stroke of brilliance, Mike came up with a solution. 
he proposed dividing their father's inheritance equally between himself and his sister-in-law. Eventually, they were able to collect the compensation and medical expenses when the inheritance was distributed. While the majority of the inheritance was allocated towards Mike's payments, a small portion did end up with his sister-in-law. Unfortunately, all the money she received was utilized for legal fees in relation to the crimes she had committed. As a result, her bank account was left nearly empty. The reason for her financial downfall was due to her selfish and unintelligent nature. She would recklessly enter into contracts with any attorney, even if they were in the midst of an ongoing investigation. These attorneys demanded non-refundable fees, causing her funds to continuously dwindle as she repeatedly dismissed and hired new lawyers. Eventually, the lawyer she had chosen, who simply followed her orders, failed to provide a proper defense, resulting in a bleak outlook for the trial. This ultimately led her to be placed under the custody of her ex-brother-in-law. It was determined that the nephew expressed a desire to live with his uncle and grandparents, who provided him with stability and support after his sister's arrest. As my ex-brother-in-law returned to a normal life, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the responsibility of caring for him. However, during a routine checkup, I discovered that I was pregnant, bringing a new sense of hope and joy into our lives. The nephew's emaciated body gradually regained strength and returned to a healthier size for his age, which significantly impacted the ongoing custody battle. With the help of a skilled custody lawyer, the nephew was successfully removed from the care of his sister-in-law, who was deemed unfit to provide a proper upbringing due to her parenting style and criminal behavior. The lawyer emphasized the love and care the nephew received from my ex-brother-in-law, ultimately leading to the nephew being placed in his care. We discussed using the events surrounding the custody battle as a lesson for our future child, emphasizing the importance of kindness and compassion. We believe that despite the challenges we faced, our happiness is just beginning as we look forward to welcoming a new life into our family.